Today I want to go a little deeper and show you how to work with the NEC program. The program is still a very interesting option since it is very powerful and costs nothing. Today I myself am very excited about the results of our calculations with the NEC program. If you don't know NEC, then stay tuned. You will know it in a moment. I invented the principle of this loop antenna myself. I calculated it for different frequency ranges, set it up, measured it and also tested it in different scenarios. I will link you the earlier videos on the top right. While NEC has already helped us to understand the radiation characteristics of these loop antennas, I have not yet explained how to work with NEC. We will catch up on that today. We will model a loop antenna, including the matching network, as a wire grid model and discuss all the details. And in case you didn't subscribe yet, you can do it now. So, how does that work with the wire grid model? Well, you can describe a conductive piece of wire using the spatial coordinates of their starting and end points. The antenna feed can also be represented in this way. The very small cycle below symbolizes this in our picture. That's exactly what we are doing now with the NEC program. We could now simply take fixed points and use them to model our antenna. We could put that into NEC and analyze the structure. But I would like to have a model where we can change the size. I would also like to be able to change the width of the feed line or maybe move the feed point a bit. That's why we use variable vectors which we can control by parameters. I will show you how it works in CocoNEC. The given commands create an input file for NEC. It is actually a text file, which I also provide for you to download in the section below. Since CocoNEC has some elements like a programming language, we can implement variable vectors quite well with it. First, we need some definitions of variables and vectors. In the inputs area, we can enter the number of segments on our wires. Then we can set the radius of the wire and the center frequency. The parameter S can shift the feeding point and the parameter B defines the spacing of the inner line, which is our impedance transformer. Then there are many vectors that we need as the start and end points of our wires. As you can see, the components of the vectors are determined by our variables. And then we get to the actual wire grid model. The first line describes our feeding element but the principle is the same as for the other pieces of wire. All wire pieces are defined by the start and end vectors, wire radius and the number of segments. Then we have to specify the voltage to be fed. Below we still have to specify the start and stop frequency as well as the number of support points in the frequency range. At the very bottom we can define two levels for the polar plots of the vertical and horizontal radiation diagrams. The program reports syntax errors similar to a compiler. Once we corrected all errors we press run. 
With this we create an input file for NEC and automatically start the program. I always find it very interesting to look at the currents on the wires of the antenna. We can really see how the antenna is excited. Here we see the magnitudes of the high frequency currents color coded. Particularly strong currents occur in the area of the feed in point and in the short circuit line. This is no surprise actually because our impedance transformer, which transforms the 50 ohms of our transmitter output to over 1000 ohms, is transforming the current and voltage accordingly too. It's great that we can see this effect so well here. Of course, you could also read the currents in the output file. I will show it here briefly. But that would be a bit inconvenient, isn't it? Next, we look at the course of the impedance at the feed point. Of course, we do that with the Smith chart. The ideal match is in the center, and the further out we go, the greater the reflection factor gets. Here, we see a frequency range of 1.8 to 3.0 GHz. The impedance of 50 ohms is exactly in the center at 2.4 GHz. In the foreground we see the behavior of the real and the imaginary part of the impedance in a Cartesian plot. And the latter really looks the same as it does in our little antenna dimensioning tool. I will link it to you in the top right. I have to say that simulating impedances isn't actually next strength. However, in this case the results are quite good. The actual strength of NEC is the calculation of radiation patterns. Let's take a closer look on that now. First, we look at the horizontal and vertical radiation diagrams for the sum of all polarizations. Then we consider only the vertical polarization. The radiation diagram on the right looks different now. It has got nulls. And this is exactly reversed for the horizontal polarization. Then you can compare vertical and horizontal polarization in one image. And then it gets interesting again, because we can also look at the circular polarization, which is of the same order of magnitude as the linear components that we have seen. Remember, this was our explanation of why the loop antennas work particularly well in a scenario with many signal reflections. Next, uh, we will have a look to the whole radiation patterns in three-dimensional space. First, the sum of all polarizations. Then the vertical polarization, then the horizontal polarization, and the circular polarization. That's really great, isn't it? The summary. Not everything that looks easy is actually easy, but fortunately there is electronics unmasked. So this would be the right time to subscribe to the channel and like the video. I'm surprised myself that NEC can simulate this type of antenna including the matching network so well. The analysis of the radiation properties reveals to us some mysteries that we would otherwise not be able to explain. 
Now let's see. Maybe I will make more videos with Neck in the future. What do you think? Should I? Just comment me. Now stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and support the channel. See you soon in the coming episodes.